Over to you, sir. Thank you. Okay, so I will try to entertain you guys regarding the topic of echocardiography for the next hour. So I will start with this one. So I usually start talks about this topic with this video and you can all have your guesses on what this is. I will not uh, take the rounds and ask everybody to provide what they are guessing. But this is illustrating a lot of things regarding what we are going to talk to talk about. And I will disclose that this is a goldfish imaged with the ultrasound, 3D ultrasound. So you can see the fins there and on the side and the tail. So this would be the front of the goldfish. So we simply trapped the goldfish in a relatively small container. It survived, so not to worry, we didn't induce pain on it. So it's, uh, it was still alive several weeks after this. Yes, but the thing to realize here that a goldfish in reality really doesn't look like this. So ultrasound is showing you an image inside the body, but it's not showing things exactly like they are. So that's why I start with this illustration. You all know how a goldfish looks and it's not an exact match. So you can see that the fins and the tail are super thin in reality, but on ultrasound, they appear thicker. So that's the first th takeaway that really thin stuff in ultrasound, it becomes thicker. Okay. Yeah, so that was a teaser for what's to come. So I will start by talking about sound a little bit. Then I will go into medical ultrasound imaging. So generic medical ultrasound. And then I will go into the topic echocardiography, which is ultrasound of the heart. And myself, I am now at GE. Previously, I was at a university here in Norway, which is called NTNU. So the content I'm showing is uh, yeah, from those two sources. So the only ultrasound equipment you will see is GE equipment, but I guess you can live with that, at least now that I'm telling you that this is not how the world actually is. It's only how it is by my perspective. So, okay, let's go. We will start by this. So mountains, something everybody in Norway loves, of course. So if you are in the mountains, you can uh, say something uh, like um, hoi. And then if you wait a little while, you will hear it back. And this is an echo, of course. So uh, an echo is a reflected sound wave. And if you have brought your stopwatch with you, then you can figure out how far the mountains are. And the reason you can do that is, of course, that you can measure the delay. and during that delay, the sound has traveled to the mountain and back. And since everybody goes around knowing that the speed of sound in a decent temperature is something like 340 meters a second, then you can calculate the distance. So that's quite cool. So that's the echo and using echo to calculate the distance to a mountain. But this is actually the most central thing we do in ultrasound because we are sending sound, it hits something, it comes back. And due to us keeping track of time, we know how far this something is. So that's very simple not, but uh, gives us a lot of possibilities. But uh, ultrasound has an ultra in front on the sound part. So it has to be somewhat difficult, different from sound. So this is a piano for regular sound. And if you play or have a, played with the piano, you know that if you hit this button here, the A, it's oscillating, uh, if it's a real piano, a real string at 430, 40 iterations or oscillations a second. If you go one A up, so to the next A, then the frequency has doubled and doubled again and doubled again. And the end of a typical piano is somewhere, somewhere around 4000 Hertz. 4,000 oscillations on the highest string. But if you keep on doubling this like this, then you will get a medical ultrasound piano. So a medical ultrasound starts a pair at one megahertz and it's used all the way up to 40 megahertz. So we are still talking oscillations 
in something uh, like strings or air or water or the body itself. So of course we can only hear stuff going on up till 20,000 Hertz. So we are starting at 1 million Hertz for the actual use in medical imaging. Um, by the way, cars and uh, bats, they are in the, mean, in the middle here. So they are using lower sounds than medical ultrasound. Then you are doing your parking assisted by ultrasound. Okay, so that was the frequency. So yeah, so it's a piano with ultrasound keys. Okay, so back to the echo thing. So how do we do this? This is a loudspeaker, ultrasound loudspeaker. It sends something, it hits something. That sound wave comes back to this thing. And then this little gadget of ours reacts as a microphone. So we have a loudspeaker which sends a sound wave. It hits some kind of object and it comes back to the microphone. So it's kind of a dual thing, both microphone and loudspeaker. And when it comes back, we register the signal that comes back. And we typically in ultrasound, we do it like this. We trace the signal. And then we annotate a piece with a high signal, white, and a piece with a dark signal as or a low signal as dark and a high value as white. And that's how we get a line like this, which to some degree then reflects what we were looking at. So if you have something which moves, for example, the heart, and you just do this, and you kind of have a time display with time along this axis and depth here, then of course we can do the depth by timing how fast things come back. And then we can repeat this with pulses again and again and again and again. Then we get this kind of nice map of what's going on within at sending straight ahead and getting it straight back. But that's not the ultrasound images you have usually seen. You have seen this ultrasound images which, which look like a sector. And they are achieved by scanning. So this is directional sound in one direction, first over here. So we are directing the sound wave there. And then we are listening for echoes. And then we are repeating the process. So this is the basic principle of ultrasound scanning. And this is also why we are talking about ultrasound scanners, by the way. So you can see the probe here. So I will, uh, if I'm, there we are. So medical ultrasound imaging, we have directed, focused sound waves, sound pulses aimed at something. And we base the image on the echoes, as I tried to show you. And we are scanning over an area to produce the images. And all of the sound pulses themselves, they are oscillating in the area of 1 megahertz to 40 megahertz. So if anybody have a question about ultrasonics, then this is a good place. If not, I will continue to the nice images we can get. So I guess this is uh, ultrasound has nice images, and especially the guys which are working with fetuses, they have kind of the most impressive images. So, and the latest trends I'm told is that they make a cost of the, your baby to be based on the ultrasound. So that's uh, slightly creepy to me, but uh, that's something people are buying these days. Uh, yeah, this is the umbilical cord where you can color the, the blood with oxygen and the blood without oxygen in different colors based on the, the, the direction of the blood actually. Uh, fetuses, of course, yes, uh, embryo. Uh, this is a liver where we can calculate the stiffness inside the liver. And this is a spine of a newborn, actually. So you can see how the spine looks. So this was uh, generic ultrasound, but I'm supposed to talk about echocardiography. So that will be on the next slide. So here is some of the nice images we can do in echocardiography. So on top, we have a 3D image. So you can see a valve in the, in the heart opening and closing. So it's, this valve is the mitral valve and the, the visual image to have in the mind is uh, the toilet lid. So you can see the toilet lid going up and down. 
and here we have it from our cat plane. So this is the same wolf, and we can see how blood is going into the left ventricle and getting out again. So we'll, in echocardiography, these are typical nice images. Echocardiography, what's special? What discerns this from all other ultrasound stuff? It's the heart, of course. So the cardio part refers to the heart. And the heart, as you all know, is protected by ribs and fat to varying degree for the last one. And the interesting stuff is going on quite deep into the body. So even something as deep as 20 centimeters, this of course depends on the size of the of the person. And there are a lot of moving parts going on. And blood, of course, moving. And it's quite complex 3D structures. And it even gets worse when it, we are talking kids or when we are trying to fix something. So the heart is not, yeah, it's not straightforward to figure out what's going on. And there is some interaction between the fluids and the tissue. Which, are, which is interesting, and there are quite a lot of different diseases. So if we try to talk about how to get to the heart, I said it was behind the ribs, then this illustration is helpful for a lot of people because you can see the probe, how we position it on the chest. So some centimeters uh, below the nipple is where the probe is positioned in the standard way. And then you can see this scanning sector going into the body. And you can see the tip of the scanning sector is then the part closest to the probe. And then the far edge of the sector is down there deep into the heart. So this is the most common way of doing it. And this is called transthoracic echo. So we are going through the thorax. And this position, which we just saw illustrated, is, is often called the apical position because we are trying to hit the apex of the heart, where we are close to the apex of the heart. There are other potential positions. And we will even talk about um, ultrasound through the mouth in some slides. But for this transthoracic, the main challenge is getting through or through the rib cage. You can either go above or below or kind of in between ribs. And that was what we just saw. So yeah, just repeating this again, the pointy edge of the sector is the point closest to the probe. So if you see here on our regular ultrasound image, this will be the probe. And this will be centimeters into the body. So you can actually see that in this patient, which is a normal patient or normal subject, there is less than one centimeter from the skin where the probe is to the heart. So this is probably true for all of you guys as well, that if only one centimeter below your skin, you will find the heart muscle which is a sobering and interesting <laughs> observation. So actually people, doctors in the old age, they could just feel the skin here and then could feel how this movement was affecting the skin. So you, to some degree, you can feel it by just placing a finger at this position. Yes, um, yeah, what do we see? So we see 16 centimeters into the body. We see the main left chamber, the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle, and we see the two atria. And the way this works is that blood arrives here from the lungs, is pumped into this chamber, then it's pumped out through the aorta, which is behind there. Then it goes to the entire body, to the toes and the heads and everything, and comes back. Then it comes back to this chamber, it's pumped into the right ventricle, and then from the right ventricle, it goes to the lungs. And from the lungs, it comes back here. So that's the plumbing going on. And this is 3D. So it's, yeah, I'm bringing down the heart. So if you, yeah, I can move the video over to the main screen, maybe. So uh, there we are. So this is how the heart more or less looks. And you can see it's a 3D 
structure with all these things going out and in. So yeah, in ultrasound, we are of course giving you an impression of this 3D structure. Yes, back on the shelf with the heart. And let's continue. Okay, uh, so how do we see something 16 to 20 centimeters behind the chest wall? What, what do you need to do with your ultrasound buttons and rotaries and stuff in order to get there? So one thing you can do is adjust the frequency. As I said, ultrasound is you know, for medical use is between one and 40 megahertz. And the way this goes is that if you have a high ultrasound frequency, you get a good resolution, but you don't get very far down. So you cannot penetrate to great depth. If you have a very low ultrasound frequency, you can penetrate to great depth. But oh, this doesn't make sense. That is supposed to be lower resolution. Yeah. So good penetration, lower resolution. And the sweet spot for the heart is somewhere around two and a half megahertz. So that's the frequency we, we typically use for the heart. But there is a additional trick, which is very common in cardiac imaging and not so common in other ways of doing this. And that is something called harmonic imaging. So I will introduce that so you guys have heard about it. And basically, if you send on two and a half megahertz and receive on two and a half megahertz, the, you get something like the image on the right. But you can see that this harmonic image is so much nicer. So what's going on here? So the thing is that when you send a pulse and there are non-linear effects going about, then your pulse will be distorted, distorted. So this is even happening with a piano, that you press a key on a piano and the harmonics of the, the sound will occur together with the frequency you are hitting at. So you remember this 440 key on the piano? You hit that one, but what you will hear if you have a signal or frequency observation device, uh, you will see that you don't only get the 440 hertz, you also get harmonics. And that's more or less the same happening with the ultrasound signal. So uh, this is a frequency plot where you see that this was the main frequency, in this case, I'm just below two megahertz, which was sent. And then this one is after we have gone through several layers, so it's measured within the Heart, then you can see we have harmonics. So that's a doubling of the frequency. So if the original one was 1.8 ish, then the next one would be 3.6 ish, and so on. And what harmonic imaging is all about is to filter out to only receive the second harmonic component. So this is kind of strange that this gives so much better images. But it does. It has been known for a long while. And the thing here, the theory or the simple model in explaining this is indeed that the wavefronts are distorted by sound speed differences when they transition down into the lake. And this causes it to get more and more harmonic components. But these components are not made at the start. They are generated after the wave has passed the probe in the skin. And then they continue to travel and they reflect. And when you receive your harmonic components are not distorted by the skin on entry, like the fundamental component is, and that gives the better images. So it's an interesting concept. Okay, so in my little agenda here of what to talk about, we have uh, started by sound and ultrasound, and we have started talking about the heart and how to get to it and how to get deep enough. So now I will talk a little bit about the moving parts. Yes, so I try to come up with an interesting illustration on the very basic concepts of filling and ejection, which are typically referred to more or less loosely as diastole and systole. So these are phases of what's going on inside the heart. 
And you can see my faucets here filling water into a container. So my container is my little model for the heart. And at this time point in the filling, there is going water in, but not out. So that's the filling phase or diastolic phase, it's typically called in literature. And then the opposite phase is the phase where stuff is going out of the container, but not coming in. So this is the ejection phase. We are ejecting blood out of the container. And that's also referred to as systole. So you probably have heard about the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And that's, which is, if you are decently healthy, it's supposed to be something like 110 in systole. So the blood pressure above 70 in diastole. So these are these two phases. And of course, when the blood is pushing blood, is blood out, ejecting blood, then it's natural that the pressure on cuff measured on your arm, like we do with blood pressure measurements, is higher than when the heart is actually filling, when the yeah, main chamber of the heart is filling. So we, we already introduced the mitral valve, and that's the valve which is keeping the input <laughs> so it will be open during the filling phase and closed during the ejection phase and then we also talked about the aorta and the aorta has the aortic valve so that's the opposite so it will be closed during the filling phase and open during the ejection phase that's how the blood gets out so this is kind of driving the moving part so this opening and closing of the valves and this contraction of the container of the left ventricle that's the main moving parts so what do we do about this of course we try to look at this using various processing techniques trying to figure out how well the walls are working are they contracting like they should be contracting or all segments of the walls contracting as they should be contracting. On the model of the heart, you can see the coronary arteries. I will try to bring back the model of the heart. So let's see. Here it is again. It's this red arteries which are on the outside and they are contributing to blood to the cardiac muscle. And if they are occluded, you are in the risk of getting a myocardial infarct. And that will impact some segments of the heart. Some segments are impacted and others are not by such an infarction. And that you can see in these kind of processed images, which can show you various segments. So this is basal segments, segments in the middle of the walls, and apical segments. So we have all this kind of different stuff for trying to analyze. And we also have different plots for measuring how fast things go. We have various ways of measuring how long these phases in a cardiac cycle is. So EP here corresponds to the ejection period. And this period from here to here corresponds more or less loosely to this diastolic period we talked about. So these are some of the measurements ways or approaches we have. And how fast do we expect things to move? And this, of course, has implications on how we can measure it. And basically, we are aiming to measure things which goes as fast as five millimeters a second. So that's quite a lot. And if you want to measure something like that in a video and you want one centimeter resolution, then you need frames which are two milliseconds apart. And that means that you need 500 frames a second to, in order to do this. And we are indeed imaging the heart in 500 frames a second. So that's quite, um, yeah, <laughs> quite slow-mo video when you play it back. And what can we do with this kind of stuff? We can look at things like this. And that this is a display not showing how fast things are moving that much, but rather where things are moving. So in this uh, plot, we are trying to show <coughs> where the, bl the blood is flowing. This one is uh, available commercially already, but this one is more cool, I think. And this is from our researcher here in Norway, which is showing how the vortexes, 
Oh, there are vortexes which are forming inside the heart when the blood comes in. I find this really fascinating. So this is one of the hot topics in research in ultrasound right now, is to figure out what impact does these vortexes have? Is it good or bad if the vortex moves? Is it good or bad to have a big one? Is it good or bad have to have several? Is it a bad sign to have none? Uh, what does all of this thing mean? And of course, this is coupled, we think, or researchers think, with the ability to get blood out of the ventricle. So here the blood comes in, in this direction, and goes out through the aorta in this direction. So you can even see this flood. So the theory is that this vortex is helping the blood through the ventricle by kind of <laughs> spinning it out. So yeah, it would be interesting. This is really at the forefront of research these days. What do, do these vortexes mean and how do they look in different populations and disease states? And how do they form and what can we learn from them? Okay, I was foreshadowing that we don't necessarily only need to put the probe outside the body, we can also put it down through the mouth. And the, doing that is called using a transesophageal probe. So that's placed on the esophagus, which is the tube where the food goes. So you can put the ultrasound probe down where the food goes, and then you can control it by this device, which this gentleman is uh, in his left arm. And basically you can then make the tip of the probe tilt in various directions. And this is uh, surprisingly enough quite safe. So, and by doing this, you get extremely close to the heart. So there is only millimeters from the inside of your tube, esophagus tube, to the heart itself. So then there is not that much distortions. And even though we have a very small probe, we are able to get quite nice images. So this is uh, an image of the Mercedes-Benz star, which is inside the body. And the Mercedes-Benz star in most people is the aortic valve. So you can see this kind of triangular structure here. So one thing there, one spike there, one here, one there. And these are three leaflets. So I said the mitral valve was like this toilet lid and then this uh, Aortic valve is like a Mercedes-Benz star, which is opening up in the middle with three, let's call it leaflets or sails. And this, doing this esophageal style imaging is very popular if there is something wrong with the valves, because then you can use ultrasound to monitor trying to fix the valves. And there are a whole bunch of minimally invasive procedures these days where you go in with the instruments and try to fix something which is wrong. And that's also quite fascinating to me that we can avoid opening up the entire thorax and instead we can just go by very pinhole surgery and see or insert our instruments and then at the same time using ultrasound see what's going on and direct the guys doing the operation so they can see what they're doing so you would see your devices also here and in you can even see the stitching quality of whatever device you connect and stitch up which is quite interesting and impressive Okay, we have covered some territory already. So we have covered uh, the heart and the normal heart more or less so far. So I thought I should say something about diseases. As you probably know, cardiovascular disease is one of the big ones at the very top of what kills people along with uh, cancer. So it says here that, and I've found the numbers for Europe, and it says half of the deaths are due to cardiovascular disease. 
but of course you could say that a lot of old people die by cardiovascular disease so yes it's kind of it's the heart that takes them in the end but they are of course old a lot of them so it's uh, yeah you could have an argument that it's age rather than cardiovascular but if you want to find the organ which fails it's often the heart And you can see that this is seriously much worse than deaths by AIDS or tuberculosis or malaria, at least in Europe. And a lot of these deaths are actually preventable. And talking a little bit about ultrasound's role in, pre in, in this, is that not all patients which are brought into the hospital and patients on uh, on something with the heart will be examined by ultrasound. Some of them will be simply examined by ECG. So ECG is this uh, electrical pads, or conductive pads, which you put on the body and then you get the ECG signal. And based on that alone, quite a lot of patients can be diagnosed. And in some cases you will be sent straight to, to an operation based on that. But the big remainder of patients are either are not conclusive by ECG and then ultrasound is the main modality to try to figure out what's going on. Yes. So I already talked about the coronary artery disease where we occlude these arteries which are feeding the heart. So that's one big one. We also have another big one, which is uh, synchronization issues and a third big one is as i already alluded to problems with the valves so the valves are indeed valves they are supposed to be tight when they are closed and supposed to let a lot of fluid through when they are open and if this doesn't happen then you get bigger or larger problems so quite a lot of us actually have um, leakages in the valves and most of us live quite well with this for some of us, this means that we cannot run a marathon or a sprint because we would not be as fit as other people would be. But for most people, they never even know that they have a small leakage. But this, of course, is quite obvious when you look at ultrasound. So when I started with ultrasound, the professor in charge, he scanned me on my first day and just blurted out, hey, you have a leakage. And I didn't know this part about the being quite common at that time point. So I was a little bit scared, but it, it, it passed. Yes, to the devices themselves, what do we do and what do GE make? So I am mostly working on the device down to the right here, which is our bedside big ultrasound scanner on wheels. So this is uh, yeah, 200 uh, to 300 kilos, quite big. And uh, yeah, a big monitor on top and a touch screen and you can, and various probes which you can connect. And these probes are these microphones and and loudspeakers as we talked about and different ones for different organs and that's because the different uh, organs as we also talked about require different frequencies if you want to see something which is quite narrow in the body you can use one probe and if you want to see something quite deep you will use another one and also for the cardiac we need to go in between the ribs and that also limits the probe so if you have seen these super big probes they are using on uh, on on babies through the mother's womb they can be super big of course because there is nothing obstructing and you have a lot of space to play with so i'm mainly working on this scanner and making software for that and sometimes like today and tomorrow i will also be replacing hardware inside it so there is a computer inside and there is also some custom hardware for ultrasound specific purposes. On the top, you can see a much more sexy product, which is uh, a handheld or pocket sized ultrasound scanner. And this uh, is more or less a smartphone with some ultrasound specific hardware. And you can see the probe here is uh, kind of uh, special it has two ultrasound probes in one casing 
So you can use it for two different applications, one low frequency application for the heart and one high frequency application, which you see illustrated there. And this is actually an image of the carotid artery, the artery going up to the head. And this in itself is an important thing because it gives you an impression of the amount of plaque you have in your carotid artery. And this is, of course, um, related to brain stroke. So if you have a lot of plaque and it stiffens, then it might someday loosen and go to the brain and that will not be a good day. So by using this and monitoring this, the doctor can hopefully tell you to that this would be a good time to stop drinking beer every day or something like that. Yes. Yeah, I, I will use the last minute to answer the question. Yes, in we are limited in 3D as you are in MR, in ultrasound as well. And we have been doing ECG gating as you are doing um, for yeah between three to seven cardiac cycles. Of course, that doesn't work for all patients. So we cannot do that for everybody. Um, so the image I was showing you of this Mercedes-Benz uh, thing of the aortic valve, that was real time actually. And what we have been doing the later years is that we have been sending not so focused beams. So you remember my, um, in the scanning part, I showed this where we are scanning one narrow beam at a time. So what we have been figuring out how to do the last 10 years in ultrasound is to send a rather wide beam and then place several virtual receive beams within the wide transmit beam. So this has given us the possibility to, to some degree overcome the speed of sound because that was the limiting factor when you were sending a very focused beam in one, one direction, then you have to wait for the speed of sound until you can receive it and generate your, your voxels for 3D. But by sending wider ultrasound beams and having several virtual um, receive lines or virtual receive sampling within the large wide transmit beams, we are able to make 3D volumes these days in, uh, in quite decent video rates, even in real time. So that's the answer on the 3D.